uh, we can see oscillomotor nerves here and cochlear nerve is coming from the dorsal surface of the brain and then the trigeminal nerve over here and uh, the, all the related areas <coughs> of the brain which i'll explain later in this, this presentation here is the close up view uh, of the Sorry, <coughs> Hassan, just go slow and loud so slow so that everybody can follow you thank you okay so here is a, a closer view of the same picture where we can see the olfactory uh, nerve and olfactory tract here dividing into olfactory stria and then here the anterior perforated substance and then uh, uh, this is optic nerve combining with the contralateral optic nerve to form optic chiasm and then the optic tract here here we can see the interpedentular fossa and the mammillary body along with uh, oculomotor nerve arising from there the, basically, all the nerves which we are going to discuss today are present in this picture, from olfactory nerve to optic nerve to oculomotor nerve and cochlear nerve, except trigeminal nerve, which is in the point. So this is a superior view of the brain. <coughs> so we can see the tentorium here. And this picture was put here to show the importance of the uh, relation, important relation of oculomotor nerve with the tent. Uh, there is nothing else in this picture which I would discuss. So the cranial nerves in Nethni can be studied in three sections. First is intracranial cord, second is foraminal cord, and third is extracranial cord. Intracranial cords can be divided into roots from where the nerves arise, uh, the which area of the brain. Then the sustainal cords, the free the free nerve, the free cords of the nerve, and then the sinus cords. And the, this is not true about cranial nerve 1 and 2 as cranial nerve 1 and 2 are uh, actually, an, uh, actually an extension of the brain itself because they are covered by auditory endocytes of uh, not Schwann cells and they have similar pathologies in the brain matter itself. So they are not considered uh, as a, 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 true, root, a true nerve uh, in this sense only. So yeah, the first nerve I'm going to discuss is olfactory nerve. Olfactory nerve uh, is located in the posterior part of the nerve. Here, below the tribulum plate, uh, we have an, uh, an olfactory epithelium. I'm, I'm sorry, Hassan. Hassan, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Yes. People are having difficulty following you. You just need to be loud and slow. Loud, because we can't hear you very well. Okay. Loud. Okay. Do you have hands free? Thank you. Uh, if you have hands no, free, I, force you. Okay. I don't have them. Oh. Yeah, so can you hear me now clear, clearer? Hello, Imad, can you hear me? Yeah, it's, I can. Yeah. So uh, I started with olfactory nerve. Olfactory nerve is the first cranial nerve. Uh, which <coughs> first cranial nerve which, we are, which I'm going to discuss. It is located in the posterior part of the uh, nose, below the tribulum plate here. Tribulum plate is a part of its void bone. Uh, below the tribulum plate, we have a specialized epithelium uh, called olfactory epithelium, which is a collection of cells, uh, uh, cell bodies, uh, giving rise to axons which travel, which travels through the tribulum plate and uh, and synapse with the second order neurons in the olfactory bulb here. They, the cell, uh, the axons of the second order neuron form the optic tract, uh, olfactory tract uh, the, the itself. Olfactory tract itself is formed by the axons of the second order neuron located in the olfactory bulb. Am I clear up till now? Good. Okay, sir. <clears throat> <clears throat> so yeah, this is a uh, simplified uh, flow diagram of the olfactory pathway. Here <clears throat> we see the, the lining which I was uh, talking about. The first order neuron synapsing with the second order neurons here in the olfactory bulb and giving rise to axons which form the olfactory tract. The olfactory tract ends at anterior ol olfactory nucleus uh, located near the anterior perforated substance. 
here the uh, olfactory tract divides into olfactory stria, uh, the medial olfactory stria, and the lateral olfactory stria. The medial olfactory stria, and so, and all of this area is called primary olfactory cortex here. Then from primary olfactory cortex, the neuron, some neurons go, uh, neurons go medially and end in amygdala, hypothalamus, and then hippocampus, and some goes laterally and synapse in the primary or uh, <coughs> secondary olfactory cortex uh, of the brain in the temporal lobe, which I'll show later. Here is a diagrammatic view uh, of the things which I just told you. Uh, this is the olfactory bulb leading to the olfactory tract, then the olfactory stria. Here we can see this is the olfactory, lateral olfactory stria, and here we have medial olfactory stria. This is olfactory uh, anterior perforated substance and optic chiasm. Optic chiasm, anterior perforated substance, and <coughs> this lateral uh, olfactory stria is not, this area is olfactory trigone. Here we can see the trigonal structure here. This is olfactory trigone. Olfactory trigone uh, is involved in the perception of olfaction only. Uh, only the olfactory perceptions are received here. And this area is collectively known as primary olfactory cortex. So uh, uh, the, uh, uh, anterior uh, the boundaries of anterior perforated substance laterally is bounded by lateral olfactory stria medially by optic chiasm. So yeah, uh, from this pri primary uh, cortex, the neuron goes to secondary cortex, which are interrhinal cortex located uh, in the uh, <clears throat> temporal lobe. This is another diagrammatic view of the, the clear diag diagrammatic view of the thing which I just told you. The, the olfactory bulb, tract, stria, anterior perforated substance, olfactory trigone, uh, primary olfactory area cortex and secondary olfactory cortex. So this is a, a real <laughs> brain specimen showing <clears throat> the olfactory bulb with olfactory tract here, showing the relation of, of the frontal lobe with the olfactory tract. So the front uh, olfactory uh, tract lies uh, in the undersurface of the frontal lobe where in with the rectus gyre uh, medially and uh, <clears throat> medial orbital gyrus uh, laterally. So this is rectus gyrus, this is medial orbital gyrus. And here we can see the anterior perforated substance, the lateral stria, the medial stria, and the trigone itself. There is another diagrammatic view uh, showing the olfactory cortex. Uh, this, this was just put here to show you the exact, exact location of the uh, olfactory cortex, which is, which is just near the anthus, most medial portion of the temporal lobe. This is the MRI appearance of the olfactory nerve. Olfactory nerves are located on the undersurface of the frontal lobe, so uh, reflected, we could see them here, and more clearly on only on the coronal cut. So this is the T2, uh, T2 weighted coronal cut. Uh, uh, MRI brain. Here we can see the arrows are pointing towards the olfactory nerve. This is another fat, uh, fat, uh, fat suppression image showing the olfactory nerve. This is a CP brain coronal cut showing the same areas uh, which we discussed, like tribulum plate here and the crystal gallia. Uh, these these areas which are uh, from uh, lateral to the tribute from plate here shown is the area where uh, olfactory nerves are located. These areas are more susceptible to damage due to trauma or uh, due to trauma and some uh, nervous pathology as well. And this is a lateral view of the CT brain. Uh, showing the tribulum plate and the crystal galli uh, in relation <coughs> to uh, in relation to olfactory tract. Uh, so yeah, nerves are not visible on CT scan, so we cannot see them here. But the uh, but olfactory nerve is is just located there on the posterior part of the nose. 
So the second nerve is optic nerve. Optic nerve uh, starts at the back of the globe uh, as a collection of uh, cell uh, exon. Started uh, of whole uh, bodies are located in the retina, and the exons uh, exit the globe as optic nerve uh, on the both sides. So uh, optic nerve travels uh, <laughs> up to optic chiasm, and here the nasal nasal field fibers, the fibers which carry the images from nasal field of both sides decay to form the optic chiasm. There we can see the the temporal field and the nasal field. Temporal field of left side and temporal nasal uh, field of the right side are forming an optic tract here. And here we can see the uh, nasal field of the left side and the temporal field of the right side are forming an optic tract here. Both of these optic tracts uh, uh, terminate in the lateral geniculate body of the thalamus, here, where, which is a relay center for the optic radiation. From there, the optic radiation starts and go to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. So this is a general pathway plan of the uh, uh, optic nerve. Optic nerve has four segments, uh, intraocular, which is about one millimeter, intraorbital, which is around 25 to 30 millimeter, intracanalicular, which is around five to 10 millimeter, or then the cranial or cystunnel, which is 10 to 16 millimeter. Here is a very nice diagram of, uh, <clears throat> of the uh, actual human uh, specimen showing the parts of optic nerves. Here we can see the, uh, the uh, optic part. Here we can uh, then the uh, orbital part here, then the canalicular part and the cranial part. This is uh, another representation of what I just told you in the previous slide, so no need to explain it again. I'm going to skip it. Again, another representation of what we just talked about, uh, about the optic nerve, then the optic chiasm, opti then the optic tract, terminating into lateral geniculate body of the thalamus, and then from there we have optic radiations going to the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. So this is how uh, an optic nerve looks like on MRI. Uh, this was put here to uh, just give you an idea of how it will be looking in the next, in next images. So these arrows are showing this wide outline uh, outside the optic nerve, which is showing that optic nerve is covered by dura and is uh, lined by CSF itself. This white line is representing CSF. Just what I told you at the start that, that optic, optic nerve and the olfactory nerve are considered as an uh, extension of the brain matter itself. So here we can see that it is covered by dura and uh, it has CSF as well. This arrow here. Here, this arrow is pointing at the exact point where the optic nerve emerges out of the uh, of the uh, globe. Here, <coughs> due to form, this is the optic part and this is the orbital part. Here, so this one is op uh, optic part. This here is uh, orbital part. This is a sagittal image, a reconstruction image of MRI showing the pathway of optic nerve from uh, orbit up to <clears throat> uh, up to the lateral genital body. So here we can see this is the orbital part here, then this is canalicular part, and then this is the uh, <coughs> cranial part. Again, the same thing um, uh, depicted in MRI, MRI spectrography. Uh, the orbital part, intra, uh, intracanalicular segment, and intracranial segment. Now we have uh, oculomotor nerve, which is cranial nerve 3. Oculomotor nerve supplies most of the muscles of the extra, or, or, or most of the or, or extra ocular muscles, except superior oblique and lateral rectus. So there are certain groups of nuclei located in brain stem where, from where it arises that, uh, that each group supplies each muscle itself. Each nuclei, the, the part of the nerve which arises from each nuclei 
applied uh, applied uh, a specific group of muscles only. So, it, uh, <coughs> as a summary, so the oculomotor nerve arises from brain stem in the interpeduncular fossa, uh, <coughs> and, and the interpeduncular fossa at the level of red nucleus or superior colligula. Uh, this is a nice diagram <coughs> so, uh, seen superiorly. This is <coughs> just uh, showing the segments of the oculomotor nerve. This is a uh, peduncle, a uh, cerebral, cerebral peduncle, and this is intercerebral uh, peduncular area from where the uh, oculomotor nerve is seen arriving. Here, this is the segment. Then we have petroclinoidal segment. And then the third one is trigonal segment. Trigonal segment is the segment from where uh, on the uh, oculomotor nerve goes into the cavernous sinus. So the part just below, just behind the cavernous sinus is trigonal segment. Then we have a uh, cavernous segment and uh, then the fissural segment from where it goes into the altar and forms the orbital segment. This is a nice picture of brain stem seen from above. <clears throat> so we can see here the interpeduncular fossa. And the, uh, and the emergence of canular tree uh, on the both sides here yeah, uh, at the level of red nucleus, which is important to know in brain dissection. This is red nucleus located at the level of superior colliculus posteriorly mm -hmm. and uh, crust cerebri anteriorly with substantia nigra. Here we can see this, these blackish dots. These are the substantia nigra. In the next picture, we can see. <coughs> In the next picture, we can see the uh, association of uh, tri uh, oculomotor nerve with posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebral artery. We can see the cranial nerve uh, tree, uh, oculomotor nerve ari of arising from interpeduncular fossa, uh, goes anteriorly, <coughs> goes anteriorly while being in between posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebral cerebral artery. And it's close relation to PCOM artery as well. Here we can see this is ICA giving off P, PCOM, uh, PCOM artery joining PCA here. So this is cranial tree and this is PCOM, uh, PCOM artery. So this, it is an important relation to remember. Then in the next picture, uh, this is a lateral uh, view where temporal lobe is retracted. And we can see again the, the same thing is demonstrated that this is cranial tree. Uh, oculomotor nerve be, be, below it, we can see uh, superior cerebellar artery and uh, here the posterior cerebral artery with ICA and of 2 as well. Then again, the same thing was demonstrated in this picture as well. So I'm going to skip it. Yeah, this is what I was talking about previously, the trigonal area, the trigonal area, which is which occurred just before the oculomotor nerve enters the cavernous sinus. So here, the cave, it is entering the cavernous sinus, so this area is a trigonal area, this uh, oculomotor triangle, basically. Uh, this is petroclinoidal ridge, uh, petro posterior petroclinoidal ligament. Ligament marking the end, end of petroclinoid, uh, start of petroclinoidal segment, then we have petroclinoidal segment and then trigonal segment here. Yeah, so next, uh, again, the same thing with PC, uh, posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebellar artery was shown here. But now in this picture, if you see the C of the, these diagrams, here we can see. The that the dura was retracted a little, and we can see the oculomotor cistern now. The this was the tri triangular area. Now we are inside. We can see the this is trigonal uh, uh, trigonal segment here before the uh, cavernous segment, and this area is known as oculomotor cistern. And before that, we have petroclinoidal segment. Then in the fourth picture, the same thing uh, is demonstrated, but now the walls of the cavernous sinus are removed. We can appreciate that we have a cranial uh, oculomotor nerve here in the lateral wall of the uh, cavernous sinus with <coughs> uh, trochlear nerve here 
in the lateral wall as well and then the ophthalmic division or trigeminal nerve you can see abusive valve here uh, here uh, with the internal carotid artery inside the uh, inside the cavernous sinus Yes, even more, even clearer picture. Here we can see that we have uh, uh, okay, this is the uh, trochlear nerve, this is uh, ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve, and this is ocular motor nerve with its segment. This is trigonal segment. And then, when we are inside the cavernous sinus, we have cavernous segment. All of these structures are located in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus with internal carotid artery and Abusions nerve inside. They have demonstrated the <coughs> the division of trigeminal nerve before it. Uh, sorry, the division of ocular uh, motor nerve before it enters the uh, superior orbital fissure. So here we can see this is uh, uh, this is ocular motor nerve which is divided into superior division and inferior division even before it enters the superior orbital fissure. That's the point which should be remembered here. That the trigeminal uh, ocular motor nerve divides into superior and inferior division before it enters the superior orbital fissure. Here, the margin of the superior orbital fissures were removed. Uh, which so uh, here so we can see it is showing the tendinous ring with uh, within which the uh, ocular motor nerve passes through with the uh, abducens nerve and nasociliary nerve, while the other nerves passes outside the tendinous ring, which are frontal nerve uh, and lacrimal nerve, and uh, <coughs> the frontal nerve, uh, lacrimal nerve, and trochlear nerve. Yeah. So three nerves outside the tendinous ring, three nerves passes inside the tendinous ring. I will demonstrate it later as well. Yeah. So the, here we can see this is superior orbital fissure here, and this is the, the ring which I was talking about with optic canal inside as well. So here we saw that this is the superior division and this is inferior division of the ocular motor nerve with nasociliary nerve in between them and abducens nerve below them. So these three nerves passes within the uh, ring. While there there are three nerves outside the ring as well, which are lacrimal and frontal. Both of them are division of uh, ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve, while uh, we have uh, trochlear nerve outside the ring as well in the superior orbital fissure. The contents of superior orbital fissure could be remembered this way easily that we have three nerves outside the ring, three nerves inside the ring with two veins in superior ophthalmic vein and inferior ophthalmic vein. Uh, these further demonstrate the uh, relations of uh, of the uh, ocular motor nerve uh, as seen from the in, in the anterior view of the orbit. We can see superior rectus muscle, inferior rectus muscle, lateral lateral rectus muscle, and then the divisions of trigeminal uh, ocular motor nerve, which is inferior division here. We can see supplying the inferior rectus muscle. And then the other uh, other nerves which are present inside the orbit uh, from the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. Uh, th this is another view. This is basically inferior view, showing the inferior rectus muscle again, where getting supplied by inferior division of trigeminal uh, inferior division of ocular motor nerve here. This is inferior lateral view here in the B picture. We can see this is uh, this is inferior lateral because we can see lateral rectus. And inferior rectus muscle, both of them, with uh, with optic nerve inside. Uh, here we can see this is the inferior division of ocular motor nerve, which is supplying the inferior rectus muscle, and then we have a superior division which is supplying the lateral rectus muscle. So the, this is showing <coughs> the uh, MRI appearance in uh, the appearance of uh, uh, ocular motor nerve and its related structures. So here we can see this darker structure here in, in, in the brain span, middle of the brain span, this is red nucleus here. Then here uh, at number three, we have a uh, substantia nigra and at four, we have cerebral peduncles here. We have cerebral peduncles. <coughs>
so we will present uh, at the four and then at five we have mammillary body here here the and at six we have cornish here uh, this seven area is no, uh, is representing optic chasm as we can see uh, th this is optic nerve and this must so this must be the optic chasm and then the optic tract itself also. So this is fornix, mammillary body, red nucleus, substantia nigra, plus cerebri, uh, <coughs> optic chiasm, optic tract, and optic nerve here. The number one is representing superior colliculus. This, this is superior colliculus, as I told you before, that ocular motor nerve arises so at the level of red nucleus and superior colliculus. So the, this is superior colliculus, red nucleus, uh, red nucleus, substantial hydra and cerebra. Then in the next picture, <coughs> we can appreciate, uh, we can appreciate this is cerebral aqueduct shown at 12 here, uh, shown at 12, then at 11, we can see the posterior cerebral artery. This area is showing the posterior cerebral artery, which is present in the Indian system, which uh, we'll discuss. And this is embryo system housing posterior cerebral artery, and this is uh, aqueduct, cerebral aqueduct, <laughs> and, uh, and at number ten, interpedicular fossa, which, uh, uh, which from which the oculomotor nerve arises. Here. At nine, we can see this is oculomotor nerve on both sides. So done with oculomotor nerve. Now the fourth nerve, which is cochlear nerve. Cochlear nerve is the is very unique in few features. That is, it is the only nerve arising from the dorsal surface of the brain. It is the only nerve which whose fibers decussate before uh, coming out of the brain, uh, while they carry only the ipsilateral fibers uh, in each nerve. So, yeah, and uh, it is uh, it is the smallest chain nerve as well, as cited as cited as uh, some by some resources. So it arises on the dorsal surface of the brain, then it goes <coughs> in the ambient system here. Then it again, like oculomotor nerve, oculomotor nerve uh, is arising from here. So like oculomotor nerve, uh, in uh, the trochlear nerve also passes between posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebral artery. Then it pierces the uh, lamina papyracea. And uh, the sorry, not lamina, the uh, membrane of pelvis. Then it traverses the membrane of pelvis, and then goes laterally, and to enter uh, the cavernous sinus lateral wall here, which is not shown here, but here is the cavernous sinus. Then it goes into the superior orbital fissure, and then it supplies the uh, superior oblique muscles, which is the only uh, muscle uh, it supplies, and it is the, the only function of uh, uh, trochlear nerve is to supply the superior of muscle. So this was just a, an overview. Now we will dive in. So yeah, the this the this was demonstrated in the previous uh, uh, slides as well. That what I was talking about that we have oculomotor nerve, then we have trochlear nerve, then we have uh, <clears throat> then we have the uh, ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve and maxillary, maxillary division of trigeminal nerve, along with abducens nerve and uh, internal carotid artery inside the cavernous sinus. And here we can see optic chiasm and pituitary in relation to the uh, cavernous sinus. Again, this is a CT uh, view of the of the same thing which we were discussing uh, in the cavernous sinus, lateral wall of cavernous sinus. So yeah, one is the oculomotor nerve. Then again, two is the cochlear nerve. Then three here here we can see this is abducens nerve, which is inside the cavernous sinus. So yeah, cavernous. Uh, then in the in the wall we can see oculomotor nerve, oculomotor nerve. Then we have uh, uh, oculomotor nerve, beneath oculomotor nerve we have trochlear nerve, then the ophthalmic division and the maxillary division here, and then the abducens nerve and internal carotid artery, and both, this is also internal carotid artery. Both are, uh, show, uh, number seven is showing internal carotid artery, so it's in the turn which it takes uh, interior to uh, cavernous sinus here. And then at number six, it is showing fornix. 
Uh, no, sorry. Red is showing optic nerve. This is optic nerve. And eight is optic chiasm, and uh, 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 nine is pituitary gland here. Yeah. So I think it help you in in gaining the concept of relations in the lateral wall of the vertebral sinus of uh, all the nerves which are located here and their relation to each other and to the internal carotid artery itself. The, <clears throat> this is a nice dissection. Uh, it was just put here to show you the emergence of proteal nerve from the dorsal surface of the vein and coming at the level of inferior follicular. So yeah. The, it was uh, previously highlighted that we, so at the level of superior colliculus, we have uh, oculomotor nerve, and at the level of inferior colliculus here, we have the proteal nerve coming around at the, uh, at the, to the ventral surface of the vein from dorsal side. So yeah, this is, this is another uh, MRI uh, uh, showing the uh, course of uh, Oculum uh, trochlear nerve, yeah. So, in the course of trochlear nerve, <coughs> uh, which is uh, showing, yeah, so first of all, this asterisk, uh, this asterisk is showing trochlear nucleus, which is uh, located around the uh, aqueduct of sylvius uh, uh, or cerebral aqueduct. Then, we by the uh, by number one, we are showing here the city, uh, inferior follicular. So uh, ocular, uh, trochlear nucleus is present at the level of inferior follicles around the aqueduct. I think it is clear now. So now by number three, here it is uh, it is shown that they are cerebral peduncles. Yeah, so cerebral peduncles. By number four, we uh, we are showing that this is posterior cerebral artery again, which is present uh, here. <coughs> and then by number five. <coughs> By five, we are showing posterior communicating artery. That's so we have ICAs here, uh, which gives off posterior communicating artery, which joins uh, a posterior cerebral artery here. So ICA, posterior communicating artery, and posterior cerebral artery here. So it is. I'm just demonstrating it again and again to make you to make your concept clear regarding the. Uh, relation of trochlear nerve and oculomotor nerve with posterior cerebral artery and PCOM artery. The, uh, again, <clears throat> here we can see the structure showed by 7 is uh, it is from the superior medullary vellum, which is not important here, but uh, at the 8, which is showing ambient cistern. We discussed it, uh, earlier that ambient cistern houses. Uh, P2 segment of uh, posterior cerebral artery basically. So yeah, this was <coughs> posterior cerebral artery with posterior communicating artery. And uh, this is for P2 portion of uh, posterior cerebral artery going into quadrigeminal system. So yeah, that was it for, for, for uh, cranial nerves up to now. Now the big one, it is uh, here's here, which is trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve arises from the ventral surface of pond, uh, basically, ventral surface of brain from the pond uh, behind the lateral pontile surface, which limits the pontine surface from middle cerebral artery. We can we cannot see here, but uh, this lateral pontine surface limits pons and middle cerebral artery from each other, and uh, trigeminal nerve is located just behind the lateral pontine cell, as you can appreciate in this picture. Another nice picture showing the emergence of uh, uh, trigeminal nerve behind the lateral pontine sulcus here. This is lateral pontine sulcus here and here, and we can see the trigeminal nerve arising here. We can also see trochlear nerve coming from the dorsal surface of the brain here in this picture as well. So this, this diagram is showing the roots of the trigeminal nerve, which consists of both motor and uh, smaller motor part and uh, a bigger sensory part. Motor parts have multiple roots, uh, uh, superior root, as we can see it here, and the inferior root. While sensory is a thick bundle of nerves which exists in, uh, which exists from the pawn, pawns, 
both of them combine and to travel up to Petrus apex uh, where they are housed inside a cave uh, a cave like structure called uh, Maxwell's cave which is made up of dura itself and filled with csf here we can see we, we should also appreciate the close <laughs> closeness of superior petrosal sinus here with the uh, root or uh, root of the trigeminal nerve I, I hope it, it is clear to all of you yeah so further further uh, explanation of the roots which i told the superior motor roots and the inferior motor roots and they have anastomosis in between themselves as well and then we have sensory roots over here so sensory roots and motor roots combine to form the trigeminal nerve and uh, which is uh, which then travels to the petrous apex and then uh, forms uh, and then it is housed inside a, uh, a dura um, dura covering which is filled with csf and this area is called maxwell state and th th <clears throat> then it further and then further goes uh, goes on then it further then it further goes on and form the trigeminal ganglion here which i'll show in the next picture so this was another. Uh, this is another anterior view, basically showing the emergence of the uh, uh, trigeminal nerve uh, from the pons. Then it, then the maxillary cave, which uh, it houses, which it houses. Uh, then we can see the emergence of. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, here we can see the the um, uh, abscess nerve arising from the pons, but uh, the only importance of putting this picture up here was the, to show the maxis scale how does it look like and what does it have like uh, it is a dural covering with trigeminal nerve inside and uh, well, it has csf inside as well another nice dissection picture uh, showing the importance uh, uh, showing the things which i just uh, um, demonstrated the import that these are the sensory roots we can see the sensory roots are coming from a totally different track and the, this is the this is the motor root uh, which is coming from a, another track which is not shown here but we can see the sensory roots uh, are coming from a different track from the spinal uh, nucleus probably here so <clears throat> before <clears throat> before we go on Trigeminal nerve has three uh, three nerve uh, in uh, terminal divisions, which are uh, ophthalmic division, and then maxillary division, and and then we have uh, mandibular division. So we uh, had discussed the ophthalmic division when we were discussing oculomotor nerve, and we uh, and we discussed it again. We were discussing cavernous sinus uh, because uh, ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve. Uh, traverses the lateral wall of uh, cavernous sinus and then uh, and then it <coughs> passes through the superior orbital fissure and then divides it to three terminal branches which we uh, which we discussed in the orbital part of the anatomy as well now uh, here this is uh, just to show you what happens to the other two uh, terminal branches of the trigeminal nerve which are maxillary division and the other one is mandibular division so just to follow the overview, this is um, a skull base seen from above, the, the, the endocranial surface. Um, let's start from here. This is cribriform plate, which we discussed with olfactory, <coughs> olfactory nerve. Then we have frontal bone here, which we can see uh, as we discussed that cribriform plate is a part of the void bone. We can see here. Then the, the, all of this is known as anterior cranial fossa. <coughs> anterior cranial fossa and Middle cranial fossa are separated by sphenoid bridge. Here, this bony prominence separates anterior cranial fossa and uh, middle cranial fossa. So, the nerves <coughs> which are present in anterior cranial fossa are uh, olfactory nerve uh, only. <coughs> then, uh, in the middle cranial fossa, we have all of them and foramen, which we are going to discuss now. So as well as start with for foramen rotundum, <coughs> which is uh, uh, okay. So this is foramen ovale, to which the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve leads the skull base. Here, yeah, this is this the uh, this uh, opening. Uh, sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Um, hands-free 
प्लग करो एंड देन स्टार्ट bad yes uh, i i can not connect it okay. first is my voice not clear clear enough no um, there's a voice from the laptop uh, of that fan laptop fan that's why oh. i i'm asking you to plug that and free then start your presentation <laughs> okay waiting the slot is in the front uh, near the keyboard yeah is it okay yeah it's much better yeah okay thank you so this is a uh, ct uh, this is the ct view of the uh, skull base uh, which is showing the foramina which we were discussing in the last slide so this number one uh, uh, shown by one here is uh, uh, the inferior orbital pressure Here, yeah. then at number two we have foramen recumbens. This foramen recumbens is the foramen which uh, through which the maxillary division or trigeminal nerve exits the brain stem. This, this area, and then the three uh, number three at foramen we have foramen ovale which I showed you in the last picture as well. And uh, this uh, foramen ovale uh, through this foramen ovale uh, mandibular division or trigeminal nerve leaves the skull base. so this is maxillary this is mandibular so this was important just to give you uh, what happens to uh, what happens to the terminal division of trigeminal nerve which are uh, ophthalmic and maxillary and mandibular ophthalmic goes out uh, of the superior orbital into the orbit and uh, the maxillary division goes out of the skull base through foramen uh, rotundum Into the foramen uh, tendum, into the pterygopalatine fossa, and then the, we have foramen uh, ovale, through which the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve leaves the skull base and goes into the infratemporal fossa, where uh, in the inside the pterygopalatine fossa, here maxillary nerve, and in the infratemporal fossa, here mandibular nerve. Both of them divide into their uh, branches, the uh, muscular and sensory. Both of them, which is not part of this, which is not a part of this lecture. So uh, this is it for trigeminal nerve uh, as far as we can go in the skull base. So this is uh, ma the maxillary division goes out of foramen rotundum into the pterygopalatine fossa, and the then the mandibular division goes out of the foramen ovale and into the uh, infra temporal fossa. Yeah, this is another view of the skull base from uh, below. Uh, uh, is it clear? Can you guys see it? Yes, we can. Uh, just uh, speak slightly loudly, please. Okay. <clears throat> so here we can see the foramen ovale, which we were talking about, through which the maxillary nerve comes out into the infratemporal fossa. This is temporal bone here. So this is infratemporal region here. The uh, uh, so uh, in which the mandibular nerve uh, divides into its terminal branches, and uh, foramen rotundum is not uh, mentioned in this uh, in this diagram. So this is a MRI view of the trigeminal nerve. So it is important to uh, know. <clears throat> so th this this area is, is pons. Here we can see see this area is pons. And this all white area is showing prefrontal cistern. This, in which we have uh, prefrontal uh, in prefrontal cistern, we have basilar artery here, the, which we can see. And this this area, this is showing the emergence of trigeminal nerve from the pons. Uh, I hope 
visible to you guys as well. This area is showing the emergence of tri nerve from the pons. Yeah, that's it. The next six perineurs will be discussed next week. Very nice, Hassan. Thank you. And uh, it was a very dense overview of all the anatomy and the I really liked and enjoyed the radiological pictures you shared with us because finally after uh, working in the lab, uh, this is how we, how we see the cranial nerves and how we should study them uh, so as to optimize our understanding of the pathology we have to deal with and also to, uh, to perform safer resections, especially with tumors which are dealing with, with these cranial nerves. And um, if we can keep going, we have prepared with uh, Professor Arraes some cases so to, to understand how this anatomical knowledge can help us uh, to, to understand what's, dealing, uh, what's going on with our cases. And uh, if uh, you are okay, I will start sharing. I, I prepared a uh, few cases related to all these cranial nerves. Can I, can I go ahead, Salman? Yes, definitely. You are the moderator, man. So we, we start with uh, the olfactory and optic nerves, and then I will give the, the, uh, the panel to Professor Arraes, so he will share us with us a, a, a very interesting case. So let me show you the... the... Can you see my, my screen, Salman? You... Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, cases one and two uh, are together. So uh, I put them together because of the discussion we can, we can have. So this is case one, 68 years old lady. Uh, she came in uh, 2014 uh, to, to the hospital and uh, she was having some headache and personality disturbances. She, she couldn't feel them, but uh, her husband was telling us that uh, she was not the same uh, that in the last uh, previous months. And the case number two came to, to our hospital uh, 10 days ago. In fact, uh, he's still in the, in the ward and uh, he came with scissors. He has been having scissors for uh, one year and he's not a very a good patient. He's not taking the medication properly and uh, he's kind of 53 years old man, uh, which really enjoys life and forgets always taking the, the, the medication. So you can see uh, where the tumors are placed and um, first one mainly more lo likely located in the planum sphenoidale. We can see the planum here. So probably the attachment is right there. And the second one is more likely a real olfactory group meningioma. So you can see how this depression uh, where the feeders are coming. And something interesting is not only to, uh, to understand what kind of uh, neurovascular structures we will find related with these two tumors, which are the optic nerves, anterior circulation uh, arteries, but also understand the feeding of these, both of these two tumors. The, the main feeders of this tumor will be coming probably from the anterior ethmoidal arteries. And I cannot show you the full video, but we can see perfectly an anterior ethmoidal artery, which was coming from the orbit. It's a distal branch of the ophthalmic artery crossing the, the, the floor of the anterior fossa and feeding this tumor. And uh, in the first one, most likely we have posterior ethmoidal arteries, but in both cases we can have, and the edema and the T2 sequences can help us to identify some uh, feeders from the pia of the of the frontal vessel uh, aspect of the of the frontal lobe. That's also important because our surgical planning can be different. So this is the the view we we can gain from an, an anterior bifrontal view. And uh, once we open the dura and cut uh, uh, the superior longitudinal sinus in the in the in the midline, we can see the olfactory nerve, which was brilliantly explained by Hassan. And this is the olfactory groove just behind the crista galli in very close relationship with it. And just posterior to it, we do have the planum sphenoidale. Posterior to the planum, we have the tuberculum cellae and both optic nerves. So in these two cases, the optic nerves were not compri compromised uh, clinically or anatomically, but th they are in very close relationship. And you can see the close relationship here in this view of the olfactory tract with both optic nerves. So this is the area in which these two tumors were growing. So this is the bifrontal root, and this is the anterolateral root, unifrontal or perional root. And we have pros and cons with both approaches. So I, I, I have um, seven, eight cases in which I did different approaches. So I, I will just share with you uh, what I think are good reasons and bad reasons to avoid or, or to choose one of these approaches. So anterior roots, mainly we have bifrontal or unifrontal, unifrontal and lateral roots, mainly we have perional 
and different variations of this serial. And as we said, we have pros and cons. And uh, in the first one, in the first case, uh, I did a bifrontal approach. It was uh, six years ago. So I was feeling more comfortable with that one. And I will uh, share with you why now I'm shifting to more lateral approaches in this kind of cases. What kind of uh, advantages we, we can have? So first of all, we have a direct access uh, to these ethmoidal arteries on both sides and to have a panoramic view of this frontal compartment. This is one of the advantages of the bifrontal approach, but then we have very important problems. First of all, we can have a huge frontal sinus and maybe we have to, to open it, which is not a big deal, but uh, we, we should keep it in mind in, in order to do a post-surgical post, uh, uh, reconstruction. We don't have direct access to the cisterns, and in my mind, this is something very important, as I will try to prove you. And finally, we don't have initial control of the anterior circulation and the optic nerves because they are hidden behind the tumor. So these are all the gaps of the bifrontal root. But this is one of the advantages. We have direct access to both sides, ethmoidal anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries, which are the feeders. This is one of the main advantages of this anterior root. So this is how we go through both sides or even only one side, quite frontal approach. This is the Crista Galli. This is the uh, 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 olfactory groove, and here we do have the ethmoidal bone, which is the uh, bone very, very in close, very close relationship with this tumor. So this is where the second case was appearing, but the first case was mainly growing in the planum sphenoidale. So something important is to understand this panoramic view, and in case we want to choose this one, we should have a quite vassal view in order to take advantage of this uh, devascularization, initial devascularization. Another problem, as we said, is that we will have, in case of bifrontal exposure, we will have to ligate the superior longitudinal sinus and to deal with some bridging veins on both, both frontal lobes. So this is why we have to go quite basal in most of these cases. And let me show you the, the case I did six years ago. This is the midline. So I ligated, first of all, the superior longitudinal sinus, quite basal, as basal as possible. And we have control on both sides. This was the first time I, I was using this monopolar. And the, the last one, the last time I, 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 I use it, as you will see why. So this is the planum. I couldn't see in this case both olfactory nerves, so probably I, I, I completely destroyed them if they, if they uh, were not destroyed by the tumor itself. So this monopolar was very nice until we reached the final part of the tumor. Without watching, without having direct control, this was like a horror movie, I completely damaged that branch, probably a distal branch of the frontopolar artery, which was feeding the tumor, but I couldn't see it. So this is what happened. Uh, the blood covered the, the, the view. And then once we clean everything, we could identify that, that artery. And now we are much more careful. We are trying to dissect these feeders and checking if this artery is going inside the tumor. This was the, the artery I damaged. So now we can see that it's feeding the tumor. We can watch it laterally coagulate it and cut it. So that was a big mistake on my side. I was uh, feeling too confident with that one. So now this is the panoramic view we are getting. And uh, the last part of the tumor, we can deal with uh, both A2s and both optic nerves. So that's a good uh, 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 control, but only we can get this direct control on the last stage. So why I like more these anterolateral roots? And first of all, I'm being influenced by my colleagues and professors, uh, Professor Venez from Czech Republic and Professor Roy Daniel from Switzerland. They are always uh, promoting these anterolateral roots and I, I, I really like them. And let me try to show you why. This case came 10 days ago. And uh, first of all, let's see how deep it is in the most anterior aspect. So I was a little bit scared about not having a quite enough view to reach this area. But you will see that with a, a terional approach quite advanced to the midline, we can get a good view of the anterior and posterior aspect. One of the gaps is that we will not be able to deal with the post with the contralateral moidal arteries, but you will see that's not a, a, a big problem. One of the main advantages is that in the direct shot, once we open the dura, we can reach this area here. This is where we have the optocarotid system, so we can open it and we can release some CSF, and this is going to be very helpful. So with this small approach, we can reach the most anterior part and the most posterior part. So we can have direct control of these neurovascular structures. We can access the cisterns. And on the other hand, we can have a good unilateral uh, devascularization of these ethmoidal arteries. So this is the view we will 
uh, want to to have at the, uh, in the first shot to access this cistern and to release CSF. So let me show you. This is the this is not a small terrional approach. I, I I don't think it's a good idea to do a small approach at least in my in my hands. So we do a big terrional approach, quite advanced anteriorly. So we have you can see we are drilling. This is very important. After doing the craniotomy, we are drilling enough the anterior fossa so as to reach the, the floor of it, so we can go quite vassal. This is very important. Then we open the dura and access the system. Once we access the system, the, the surgery changes completely. We have direct control of a1 of thick nerve, and we can devascularize this ipsilateral part of the tumor. So once we are devascularizing and debulking the tumor, we will be able to dissect these feeders. So then you can see how anterior, how can we go so anterior? This is the crista galli, and we are going quite anterior from this unilateral approach, and we are doing the crista galli because we want to take the tumor on the other side. So debulking, now moving posteriorly. This is the contralateral optic nerve, so you can see how good this unilateral approach is. And these are the feeders that are always there at the end of the surgery if we go by frontal, and we can see them. You see this artery? This is the one I damaged completely because I was not having direct control of it with the bifrontal approach. This is why I, I wanted to show you this video because it's quite illustrative of one of the gaps of the bifrontal craniotomy. This is the, the last part, the hyperostosis, and this is the view we get once we remove the tumor. Both optic nerves, same view, a little bit than the bifrontal. So that's why I, I wanted to share with you uh, that case. And uh, let me show you an, another one related to the, to the optic nerve. And then we can continue with Professor Wright. So this is a, a lady who was diagnosed with an optic neuritis. Uh, I think it was 2015. And she was not improving with corticosteroids in the neurology uh, department. And then she came completely blind uh, two years later to our clinic. And you can see a lesion located right there, in the right optic nerve, in the intraorbital part of this optic nerve. We know the parts because Hassan explained them very nicely. And you can see how this, probably this optic shift, mini geoma, is just stopping there and just before the, uh, the optic canal compartment. But in this case, we have to be very, very uh, delicate, trying to uh, understand, uh, identify where the tumor is growing. So this is an anatomical specimen of the right orbit. So you can see the optic nerve here, and this is the optic sheet. So this is where the tumor is growing, right here. And this meningioma, if we leave it, probably it will grow posteriorly, and in some cases it can even grow to the contralateral uh, optic nerve. So this is the anatomy we must be aware of, the relationships of this optic nerve with the rest of the of the intraorbital nerves, and these are the segments, the cisternal or intracranial segment, this is the intracanalicular segment, and then we do have the intraorbital segment. So in this case, we, we wanted to completely disconnect and uh, remove the tumor in the intraorbital aspect, right here and here. And as Hassan has been explaining us, we have CSF right there. So it's very important to ligate it in case we want to, to completely cut it, because we have CSF surrounding the nerve. So <clears throat> this is the view we will want to gain because we want to have control of the intracranial, intracanalicular, and intraorbital segments of this optic nerve. So this is the gran craniotomy we want to do, a terrional approach, and roofing the orbit and doing a lateral orbitotomy also. So this is the optic canal. Sorry, one more moment. This is the optic canal. So I have unroofed it in this dissection. So this is the close relationship between the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure. So first of all, we will do the lateral and superior orbitotomy to go to, to, go to the intraorbital part of this tumor. So this is the keyhole in the terion, a little bit more anterior to terion. This is the anterior fossa, this is the orbit. So we will do our perional because we want to expose the whole extension of the optic nerve. Then we are drilling the lateral wall. This is the filling of the, of the middle fossa. And then we open the lateral aspect nerve and what we want to reach here extradurally is the optic canal so we want to unroof extradurally this optic canal so once we have it this is the optic canal unroofed we open the periorbit and we want to identify the intraorbital segment of the optic nerve so here it is and you can see it's completely insufflated by this mini geoma and then we want to go anteriorly to the globe 
So here we have the eyeball. This is where we ligate it with silk. We cut it and then we move posteriorly. I, I am measuring it to make sure that I'm removing the whole tumor and we also ligate it so as to avoid some CSF leak. Then we open the dura to the intracranial segment. And in this case, we wanted to cut it. The patient was completely blind for two years. And we sent this piece of the optic nerve to the pathology to check that there was no tumor there. And we were very lucky. There, were, there was no tumor there. But we are trying uh, to avoid that this tumor is spreading through the chiasm to the contralateral side. So that's the post-op. You can see the pre-op and the post-op here. We cut it just anterior to the intracanalicular segment, and then we cut it the intracranial segment. So this is what we did. We cut it here, here, and then the intraorbital segment. So that's all. Uh, I think Miguel is ready there, and he's going to share with us another case. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Salman, I think uh, I just one word about uh, Pablo's cases. Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, Sorry, can, can I be heard, <laughs> Salman? Yes, we, we can hear you. Go on. Okay. I didn't uh, know you were there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I I think uh, in these uh, days of COVID, probably one advantage you can always quote of the anterolateral approaches is that you don't open the sinus. Even if you open it from inside, I think it is e equally bad. So maybe that is one other advantage. Uh, one other thing which I just wanted to mention uh, in a sort of concept is the fact that uh, we are always talking of mobilizing the Mobilize. frontal lobe. I from laterally or from medially. We don't even think about retracting the frontal lobes uh, directly. So when you actually talk of a lateral <laughs> frontal uh, approach, you are talking of all, all you took together, which is absolutely fine. Similarly, I think when we talk of the uh, bifrontal approach, what we are basically talking about is interhemispheric approach, where we are pushing the frontal lobe slightly laterally and trying to gain space over there. Do you do this with ligating the sinus or not? It's a different matter. Sometimes you can get away without ligating the sinus. Sometimes you may have to ligate the sinus, depending on how broad the dural attachment is. And the third, a little variation which we may do if the tumor is not so widely attached is uh, rather than you know drilling in front, if you have hyperostosis, drilling is absolutely necessary and fine. Otherwise, you can approach the tumor circumferentially first going towards the back, getting the back of the tumor first and then getting the tumor forwards. And uh, you can avoid probably drilling too much of anterocranial fossa. So these were the three points I thought I should uh, mention. Maybe Miguel has some other points. <laughs> okay. Pablo? Yes, I can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. okay, so, well, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, uh, Dr. Hassan for the wonderful anatomical presentation. Also, Pablo, very nice cases. Well, I think that uh, there are several possibilities. Uh, we have done many approaches for anterior, uh, anterior fossa meningioma. My current uh, perspective has been for uh, small cases, of course, I do just a unilateral subfrontal approach, but now even for bigger cases as the one you have shown, my, my personal preference uh, nowadays is doing a subfrontal unilateral craniotomy. And uh, from one side, I think you can remove everything. I like very much uh, what you have shown, uh, Pablo, that is the drilling of the, uh, of the Crystal Galli and even in cases, big cases that are going even, uh, you know, behind uh, the falcs, you can coagulate and cut the falcs to completely see the, the upper and contralateral uh, aspect of the tumor. I think that uh, from one side, you can remove 
completely the lesion. Maybe it takes uh, some time. Uh, you have to take care because you don't have contralateral view. You don't have very good uh, posterior and upper view. And going to the other side, uh, or, uh, I mean, to the, uh, going to a different uh, strategy, what I have done for those big cases in the past has been a uh, bifrontal craniotomy, even transecting frontal sinus, because as Pablo mentioned, one key issue is cutting uh, the, the um, superior longitudinal, longitudinal sinus in a very low, uh, in its a very low aspect, trying to avoid the cutting of the bridging veins that sometimes, if you uh, interrupt, may provoke uh, some uh, postoperative uh, venous infarction. So I, I have been moving from these two policies at the, at the very beginning, doing bifrontal craniotomy, even transecting frontal sinus, uh, just in order to coagulate as soon as, uh, as possible the feeder of the tumor and trying to avoid any manipulation of the frontal lobes and at the same time trying to, to have a superior and uh, a, a, a perfect midline view that is very comfortable when dealing with the, the two segments of the, the two A2 segments of the uh, anterior um, cerebral artery. But nowadays, my philosophy is just going unilateral approach. No, it's no eyebrow, a small craniotomy, a bigger one. But I think that by means of this approach, you can deal with the, with the whole uh, tumor. Thank you. This is my, my, my view. OK, good. There's a uh, question. How low for bifrontal transbasal craniotomy would you recommend for olfactory meningioma? Excuse me, Herman. The question is: uh, How low would you go? Would you go completely flush uh, when you're doing these uh, uh, meningiomas uh, with transbasal approach? Well, uh, when uh, when we decide the the bilateral uh, approach, we do a very very low craniotomy in as low as possible, transecting frontal sinus, because uh, this is the way you can start managing let's say, the feeding area of the tumor, and you can start removing the tumor literally without touching or without uh, retracting both frontal lobes. Part of the morbidity uh, in this approach are not coming from what the tumor had done before, but because of the manipulation with the retractors of both frontal lobes. So for me, when deciding, through bifrontal craniotomy, I do a bifrontal craniotomy, and also very, very, very low transecting frontal sinus, uh, sorry, uh, uh, longitudinal sinus, very low. There is no, almost no bleeding at that point, and this is the way you can lift up the um, dura and, um, and longitudinal sinus after ligation, and you can start working and manipulating the tumor subfrontally and at the same time, inter, interfrontally. This is my, my, I'm trying to, you don't need, and you should avoid, uh, in my opinion, retractor, just only cotonoid. And in so far as you are doing the bulking, just after that, when the pressure has been uh, released, you can go to work in the plane between a uh, subfrontal area and the tumor itself. Okay, and what about planning? If you have a large, um, frontal air pocket, if you've got a large frontal sinus, would you, in your planning, would you consider that you're going to change the approach? Well, no, no, even, even though you can, if, 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 you are, uh, if you are dealing with a young patient or imagine a kid that they don't have a much, uh, uh, don't have a big uh, frontal sinus, it's okay. But if you have a, a, a huge frontal sinus, it doesn't matter. You have to transect that and after that, you have to make the cranialization. What I do is just uh, after craniotomy, you expose the sinus, you remove the mucosa, you coagulate inside the sinus just to eliminate any, any remaining mucosa that later on could provoke uh, mucosili. I fill, let's say, the half sinus that is at, at the base 
with cotonoid with antibiotic and I forget it. I do a second, of course, uh, a second uh, fill uh, before opening the, the, the dura. And I open the dura in, in, in that way, something like a, like a uh, uh, you know, going very low here for the, uh, for the transection of the sinus and something like that is enough. I mean, cutting the dura. After cutting here, you can lift, you put something that is pulling by gravity, pulling, uh, pulling down and just going to the, to the tumor. No matter how big the frontal sinus is, you have to transect and as low as possible, just uh, at the level of the orbit and just in between both orbits, just doing something like that uh, because uh, finally the reconstruction is going to be the, the same and you gain, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, perspective. Okay, so shall we move on to the case? Okay, thank you. Well, I'd like to, to, to start uh, my formal part of, uh, of the, my, my presentation in this webinar. First of all, thanking very much uh, uh, Dr. Salman Sharif for his kind invitation, congratulating him for, um, again, a wonderful seminar in an endless uh, uh, job uh, on his side regarding education. And uh, I like to express uh, my, my happiness being uh, invited along with Pablo Gonzalez, who is one, nowadays one of our prominent neurosurgeons and may, may be the, the person with the, the largest experience in, in neuroanatomical lab work. Thank you so for the kind invitation. Well, I have prepared a, a case uh, uh, trying to deal. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. And uh, I have prepared a case just to deal with uh, one, tri one lesion involving trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve anatomy has been very nicely described by uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Giffray. And I think that uh, we have to distinguish two important segments. One of, of them is the intrasysternal and pontine uh, uh, segment. And the other one we can see more or less over here, let's say the interdural. Yeah, uh, sorry, we cannot see your, we can see your screen. At least I can see your screen, but not your presentation yet. Ah. Okay. Can you see my screen? No? no we, can see, we can see the, the folder, which says Petrus Apex. But maybe what you are sharing is the... Okay. Could you press screen stop, stop screen share and again screen share? Okay. And you can you, you can share your desktop, the full desktop. Yeah. Better? Yeah. Much better. And now? Thank you. Perfect. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you for also showing me this, showing me this, this trick for the for the next uh, webinars. Okay. So let's move to the to the case. This is a 45 years old uh, uh, patient with uh, progressive clinical symptoms uh, related to unsteadiness, right trigeminal neuralgia, and incomplete right uh, abducens palsy. This is the MRI. You can see the lesion that is uh, occupying the petrous apex. You can see where the uh, dura mater has been broken and violated and how the lesion is getting inside uh, the petroclival region. You can also see some sort of displacement of the right uh, uh, petrous carotid uh, segment of the carotid artery. And also the lesion here, the lesion here, the relationship with the pontine region and this is the key image for me because we can see the lesion and at the same time, at the same time, we can see the intrasystemal segment of the uh, trigeminal nerve, giving explanation for the clinical symptoms of the patient. We are going to uh, show the way we manage to remove this tumor by means of the extended middle fossa approach. I think that uh, the, 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 the previous uh, presentation from Dr. Hassan 
has been very eloquent uh, talking about the segment of the, 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 the aspect, the anatomical aspect of the trigeminal nerve. We have to keep in mind that uh, we can see this is right side. This is the, the cisternal segment of the fifth nerve. We can see how uh, by just getting inside through porus trigeminalis is getting inside Meckel's cave. And you can see how in this uh, moment, the fifth nerve is the, the, uh, converted into Geser and Ganglion. And after that, the three division we very well know. In this uh, image, the, the, the Petrus apex has been drilled. We can see that underneath we have the inferior petrosal sinus connecting the jugular bulb with the cavernous sinus. And here, the superior petrosal sinus has been interrupted. This is a Petrus carotid artery. This is a cochlea. And this is the content of the internal auditory, uh, auditory canal. So this uh, uh, image is uh, showing where the lesions were growing initially, petrous apex, and particularly coming from the junction between the petrous bone and the sphenoidal bone. Typically, the lesion coming from this structure are chondrosarcoma, low-grade chondrosarcoma. And uh, the extended middle fossa approach is just going uh, through the apex toward the content, intradural content of the petrochloral region. This is one uh, uh, image coming from one publication, Dr. Secker and Dr. Sen, 1994, showing how the petrus transpetrus approach converted into extended middle fossa approach gives the opportunity to get inside the petrochloral region. And this is uh, another, another image showing that we have drilled the, the petrous apex. We have shown this is GSPN, greater superficial petrosal nerve, carotid artery, third division of trigeminal ganglion. And we have to expose the dura and with some uh, cuts at the dura, including the ligation of the superior petrosal sinus, we can make this opening and getting inside the cisternal aspect of the, or let's say, a petroclival aspect of the tumor. So we just have to mention that for this kind of approach, always irrespective of going extradurally, irrespective of going intradurally, just to the petrous apex or through the petrous apex inside the posterior fossa, we have always to follow the same surgical steps. We have to start with a craniotomy that can be a frontotemporal craniotomy. In some cases, a small temporal craniotomy. In some cases, CIOC, zygomatic um, osteotomy. We very seldom do that. We just in case we do some limited osteotomy of the uh, zygomatic art because the usefulness of this uh, strategy is just to allow the temporal muscle to be reflected downwards so we have a better angle with less retraction of the temporal lobe. So if we go extradurally, I think it has been important, the radiological slides we have seen before showing the anatomy. And we always see more laterally the most lateral structure is uh, the middle meningeal artery coming from foramen spinosus. Take into account that sometimes due to the uh, huge variability of the venous anatomy at this area, we can, we can have a lot of bleeding not coming from the artery, but coming from the venous uh, around uh, the venous uh, plexus around, around the artery. We have to coagulate, we have to cut, and we have to plug with some bone walks to avoid further bleeding. Immediately uh, medial, we will have the third division of the trigeminal nerve. The third division of the trigeminal nerve is not uh, allowing to see. We can see this uh, uh, view. This is a picture of one of the publication of Professor Dolan. And once we are just reflecting and exposing the p 2 apex, we do not see the trigeminal ganglion. We just see the middle medial artery and this, until this point, the third division of the trigeminal nerve. So we have to do some strategy 
that is called peeling. As we all know, this peeling uh, is just uh, reflecting and dissecting the dura and showing the trigeminal ganglion that is an extradural structure that is at the same time called uh, to, uh, just uh, said to be in uh, an extradural interdural uh, fashion. So we have two, that's, that way we can expose the petrous apex. After that, in this case that we want to get inside the posterior fossa, we have to ligate the superior petrosal sinus that sometimes can be uh, only coagulate and, and, uh, and cut. Some other cases need a formal ligation due to the caliber and, and volume. And I have to mention that immediately after the third division of the trigeminal nerve, and in so far we are exposing the petrous apex, we have to identify this structure. This is the GSPM, greater superficial petrosal nerve, that is going to join carotid artery. And this is what happened at the petrous apex. Very frequently, we will see not the carotid artery completely uh, hidden inside the petrous bone, but just almost at the surface uh, with some thin cartilaginous layer. So take care because in so far as you go medially to the, uh, to the uh, third division, you can damage the carotid artery if you are not aware of this uh, absence of bone in this area. So doing that, this is the way, okay. Okay, this is the way we are just uh, at the right side and we are, oh, okay. And we are just trying to identify the middle meningeal artery and the third division. In that case, they are together and we have to make some dissection. And that way, in this case, we are identified at the right side of the dissector, middle meningeal artery. At the left side, you can see the, uh, the uh, third division of the trigeminal nerve. So in that moment, this is the third division. We have do been doing the peeling. What we see here is the dura mater, and this is the third division. This is after coagulation of the uh, middle meningeal artery, and those fibers are the fibers of the GSPN that has been fortunately identified and, and preserved. That way we are doing the dissection. You can see the difference. Okay, this is the third division of the trigeminal nerve, and this is the ura matter of the temporal bone, temporal bone uh, reflected. Here we have the uh, GSPM, we have the dura mater, and we just started to expose the petrous apex. And until which extent do we have to uh, expose the petrous apex? We have to use our rotom dissector. By the way, this is the one I like to, um, to, to, to use, and this is fair because it is a rotom anatomy webinar. And we have to use the dissector and expose petrous apex until the moment you can go around this uh, edge of the, uh, of the petrous apex. So from this uh, moment on, you have to start drilling the petrous apex. You don't have to continue the dissection between dura mater of the temporal lobe and, 30, and uh, geserian ganglion. Uh, this is the way, okay, we can move. And we start, in this case, we are drilling. This is a normal bone at the petrous apex. We will see how in certain moment, you will see the drill getting inside in that moment because it's uh, resistant and is uh, much less due to the consistency of the tumor. We have to drill around, continue drilling, take into account that over here, you can find cochlea, over here, you can find the content of the internal auditory canal, but before that you will see that the cancellous bone is converted into a cortical bone as uh, in any uh, natural uh, foramen at the skull base. So move around and we can see, this is third division, we have been exposing the dura of the petroclival region, this is the dura of the superior aspect of the 
uh, temporal pyramid, and over here is uh, the, the internal auditory canal. We have been drilling, we continue drilling. Okay, move to the next step. In this moment, we have managed to drill around. Uh, we have, uh, this is the third division again, in order not to lose perspective. This is the dura mater of the petroclival region, and this is Petru, uh, Petrus carotid artery. You have uh, to, to, to take care about that. And just, uh, you can realize how anatomy is, is always the same. Laterally, middle meningeal artery, medially third division of the trigeminal nerve, medially Petrus carotid artery, medially Petrus, uh, Petrus bone. And this is the way we have been exposing that. We have removed some tumor over here. And, okay, we have removed the tumor inside the petrus apex. But if you want to see the area where the tumor is coming from, that is to say the junction between the petrus apex and the clival region, you have to either cut the third division of the trigeminal nerve, not now, not allow nowadays when I started to do this operation more than 25 years ago, we used to cut the third division of the trigeminal nerve and after that suture in that. But now we have a different strategies and we can have this microsurgical assisted uh, procedure. And you can see the way by means of the endoscopy, we can identify some remaining tumor here that can be uh, removed in as much as possible. Okay, this is the, the, the tumor. And then we have to do that. This is uh, the right side, of, of course. This is the petrus apex. And now we are uh, cutting the dura in a parallel fashion. This is the, 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 the dura that is in contact with the lower and the inferior aspect of the temporal lobe. Okay, very important to take into account this is, let me show this because this is a very important detail. Uh, we start to cut the uh, dura mater here, but take into account that this is the third division of the trigeminal nerve. And number one complication in this approach is when you are cutting with the scissor, underneath this layer of the dura, you have the intrasystemal segment of the fifth nerve. So take care in this, uh, in this part, do this cutting, and if you want to, uh, to avoid the damage of the third nerve, you can go in some retrograde fashion following the nerve from anterior and lateral to medial and posterior. Okay. So, sorry. Okay, let's move forward. And now what we have to do, we have to cut the superior petrosal sinus that is going in that direction. In that case, fortunately, it was enough coagulating. And see how close the cisternal segment of the fifth nerve is to this uh, uh, area of the dura mater and superior petrosal sinus. So I mean, you can very easily damage the nerve. So take care. We are just coagulating. and we can cut. And what we are exposing right now is the, the cisternal segment of the fifth nerve. But uh, I, I insist it's uh, very easy to damage that. This is of course intradural. We are just cutting the dura. So this is the intracitternal segment. This is right porus trigeminalis. This is trigeminal ganglion and third division, second division over there. We continue exposing the lesion that way. This is of course dura mater of the petroclival region. 
I just uh, managed in, in that uh, case to push laterally uh, the bulging part of the tumor just to uh, exist and remove the tumor uh, far from the pontine region in as far uh, as possible fashion. I just move the tumor toward the petrous apex to work uh, uh, here uh, safely, let's say. Sorry. Okay, and this is the last part. This is the fifth nerve. This is the anterolateral pontine region. The tumor was very adherent. But you can see the way very carefully we managed to dissect the tumor from the lateral pontine region, as you can see here. This is the last part of the operation, the removal of the, of the tumor. This is the anterolateral lateral pontine region after decompression of, of the tumor. So this is the tumor preoperatively, and this is the MRI after a complete resection of the tumor by, by means of this extended, uh, extended uh, transpetrous approach. And I like with this case uh, to show how we have to, to domain the anatomy of the fifth nerve. We have seen the part related to the tumor, the other part not related to the tumor, but uh, necessarily managed uh, from the surgical point of view in order to completely remove the, the lesion. This is uh, the last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, thank you for the kind invitation. Thank you, Miguel. I think it was amazing. A brilliant show of anatomy there and, and to dissect everything off so beautifully was really enjoyed that. Um, is Chandra there? Chandra, your comments? I see Nicolay Peep is here, so let's ask him for his comments. Nicolay, please unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Yeah, it was a uh, great talk indeed and uh, very good anatomy and uh, correlated with the, uh, with the clinical uh, and intraoperative. So I, I enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Pablo? Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, explanation uh, in vivo of how uh, we can take advantage of understanding anatomy since the very beginning of understanding the incision to the muscle flap retraction, transigoma or not transigoma in case you want to reach uh, deeper the petrous apex and how you opened uh, the superior petrosal sinus going down all the way. I mean, it was beautiful. A GSPN, B3, everything. So it was very, very nice to, to see the, the previous uh, anatomy slides from Hassan and then to, to understand why why we have to, to master the anatomy. Thank you so much, Miguel, for taking your Thank time. You. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Miguel, Maria. what about monitoring? What kind of monitoring would you use when you're doing this case? Well, uh, we use uh, in, in any lesion that is uh, distorting brainstem, we routinely use uh, uh, long pathways monitoring, somatosensory about potential and, and motor about potential. For lesion involving, in that case, the sixth nerve, even the patient had already uh, some involvement of the sixth nerve and uh, neuromonitoring of the sixth nerve is, is difficult. We use monitoring of cranial nerve. In that case, the sixth nerve that was involved, the fifth nerve, although, you know, uh, the consequences of damaging the fifth nerve are less uh, terrible yeah. than others. And of course, seven and, and eight, because uh, um, although the lesion did not involve seven and eight, the manipulation inside posterior fossa, I have to mention that uh, to my mind, uh, immediately after getting inside the petrochival region, you will find seven and eight. So you have to, to monitor that. And sometimes the, the seven and eight are not, uh, are not uh, from the clinical point of view, very relevant, but are displaced and in very close contact with the posterior and inferior aspect of the tumor. So we do also monitor, uh, in that particular case, we do also monitor seven and eight. Okay, Chandra? 
No, I think a uh, very nice uh, demonstration, uh, Miguel, and uh, in fact, even earlier from Pablo. And uh, uh, overall, a very nice session to learn uh, how to preserve these nerves and how to take care of them during various approaches. Okay, brilliant. Um, can we see the multiple choice questions? Can we enlarge them, please? Oops. So we can't see the picture, no? <laughs> Mark, we can't see the... <laughs> how, how are we supposed to know where? So we need to see the questions then. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, okay. This is not the question. First question is uh, an image. One second. So, so show us the image, yeah. and then we can. Okay, so we are asking about number eleven. This one. Can you enlarge that, please? Um. Yeah. Number, so number eleven. 11. So any takers? Anybody wants to raise the hand and answer? Mm. <laughs> yeah, Rajesh Party. Uh, so let's see what Rajesh has to say. Uh, that's yeah. oculomotor now, sir. Mm. Hello? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Sir, uh, that is oculomotor now, sir. Okay. Okay. So. All right. So, can we uh, do? We have any more um, uh, of these? Of the questions are simple. Do we have any more of yes, diagrams? Sir. No, no, no. There was only one. Okay. So then, go back to the answers again. Hassan, these are yours or these are Pablo's? I don't know. These are mine. Okay, so Hassan, you want to take them then? Enlarge them, yeah. please. Yes, I want to. Okay. Can you see them, Hassan? Yeah. No. Yeah, this is done. So uh, the structure labeled uh, as 11, uh, 50. Six percent uh, answer D, which is correct, oculomotor nerve. Then uh, the second majority was sixteen. Yeah. So. Okay. Next. Which of the following is not a content of foramen ovale? <clears throat> the the un most answers are uh, greater superficial petrosal nerve, which is the correct answer, by the way. Good. After exiting brainstem, oculomotor nerve passes um, between uh, super, uh, superior, between superior cerebellar artery or ICA, and then superior cerebellar artery and PCA and PCA and superior cerebellar artery and ICA and basilar artery. The correct answer is uh, posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebellar artery. The fifty percent got it correct. Okay, good. And B was correct also. Sorry. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you can 80%. It. 80%. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good one. Okay. So medial, boundary of, medial boundary of olfactory trigone is formed by Medial olfactory stria, uncus, hippocampus, optic chiasm. So 45% got it right. This was optic chiasm. Then this. Okay. No, 34% got it right. Sorry. 34% only got it right, which was optic chiasm.
anterior yes, and middle anterior yeah, and middle cranial fossa are separated by dorsum sella uh, clinoid process sphenoid ridge and lesser wing of sphenoid uh, so sphenoid ridge is the uh, correct answer 45% got it right 46 okay then <clears throat> we have medial wall of orbit is formed by uh, cribriform plate crista galli lamina papyracea and sphenoid bone the correct answer is c which 43% got right 44% okay sphenoid Intra bone orbit. is either part of the medial wall also what is phenoid bone Gee, can we go back phenoid bone have a look at that here. again go to six sorry please. hasan <laughs> i'm not sure i'm asking if the s what? some part of the s phenoid bone could be part of the medial wall is is also part also yeah also the, the posterior the posterior uh, half let's say is a small part of the sphenoidal bone the apex My, so 70% my... got it right then. Yes, that's it. That's a positive way. Okay, good. <laughs> Asan, you have to make better questions next time. <laughs> no, they are good. They are good. Intraorbital yeah. intraorbital nerve comes from <clears throat> so ophthalmic division, maxillary division, mandibular division and frontal nerve. So maxillary division is the right answer which 58% got right. Correct. Okay. good so uh, anterior perforated substance is associated with olfactory memory olfactory perception taste perception lacrimation uh, the answer is written over there olfactory perception around 38% got it right okay good most common vessel compressing trigeminal uh, nerve uh, answers are superior cerebellar artery pica uh, ica and superior petrosal vein the correct answer is superior cerebellar artery a which 54% got right Okay. <laughs> which which nerve is a content of uh, cavernous fibers? Proprian nerve, abducens nerve, optic. Come nerve, to the answer. Optic. Come to the answer. Answer is abducens nerve, but there was another option added of others. So a lot of people added others. Okay, good. That's very good. Um, uh, can you show us what we have got left for next few days, or what do we have planned for? Okay, so we have the Korean team on Monday, and Nikolay P. and Oscar uh, Alvis will be joining them as moderators. So we have Hyung Sung Kim and Kang Tech Lim. both of them are good friends and both are going to be talking about endoscopic ways of doing a fusion and discectomy uh, next and next we have um, tarik khan talking about neurotrauma guidelines in lower middle income countries and tarik imtia is talking about cranial neuro monitoring from saudi and we have franco and randy uh, joining us as moderators and uh, is that all oh Well, we are doing a virtual World Spine. So, World Spine Column Society is coming up uh, instead of World Spine 2020. We're going to do this virtually this year. So, 29th, 30th August, and we have some amazing lineups of speakers. Uh, we have uh, FSEC submission for as well for uh, juniors, and we have submission for posters as well. 
and all that will be displayed on the website of World Spinal Column Society. So we'll keep you posted. It's just to give you the dates for time being. Okay, next. That's all. Um, any comments from Chandra before we close? No, I think excellent uh, teaching session and uh, thanks Pablo, thanks uh, Professor Ariz and uh, Salman. And uh, I think you have quite a uh, great programs lined up uh, in future. So I should be seeing you often. <laughs> no, I think next weekend we have Nelson as well. Um, uh, yeah. We have a pituitary skull base with IFNE, WFNS endoscopy committee. So I think that's going to be fun as well. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing you all. Uh, Miguel, few words. Well, uh, again, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Thank you. Again, uh, congratulations, Salman, because uh, maybe you are the most active person all around the world in an organization of uh, teaching activities. And uh, they all are superb and I enjoy very much every time uh, I have the pleasure to, to join you and the, and the friends of, of the Pakistani society. Pablo, congratulations again. By the way, just uh, my recommendation to the, uh, the younger colleagues in the audience to attend the uh, neuroanatomy courses uh, arranged by Pablo uh, González and, and his colleagues in, in Alicante, Spain, because uh, they, they are marvelous. And I hope, Salman, I will, ha I will have the honor and pleasure to participate and meet you all again very soon. Sure. Thank you. Sure, definitely. I think uh, on those two days when we have neuroanatomy sessions, we haven't kept any webinar to ensure that we are there. And I'm also moderating one day um, uh, in those webinars. So, you know, we'll see you there definitely. Um, and um, uh, we have a group photograph at the end. So can we all switch on your videos, please? Everybody who's still there, can you switch Vladimir. on the videos? <laughs> Vladimir was hiding. Uh, where is Vlad? <laughs> oh my God! Sorry, now, it was to, to 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 tell something. You know, there was nothing to add. A little <laughs> bit, uh, I I would discuss a little with you, but it it was perfect. Anyway, <laughs> good to see you, Vlad. So let's good have you, a you, Salman. Yeah, pleasure. So we're going to see you again soon. Uh, let's uh, have a group photograph. So uh, uh, Imad, can you do that for us, please? Yes, sir, I'm on. So can we all switch on our video so that um, Imad can take a group photograph, please? And we all can smile. It's OK. Yeah, it's right. Thank you. OK, brilliant. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. It was wonderful um, seeing you all again. It's really our pleasure. Uh, Vlad, it was really uh, nice to see you there. Uh, and Nicola to join to join us. Chandra, as always, has been brilliant, has always supported us. Uh, what can I say? Pablo is doing a great job, as always. Uh, you know, our young guys are so impressed with uh, Pablo, always talking about him. Um, and Miguel, you have, you have really been a force behind all these webinars.